all came together, I was thrilled because it really is such an interesting intersection between technology and private equity. And this year really feels like an inflection point for both, both sectors. So maybe just to kick things off, we could start with what the public market sell-off has meant for what you do for each of your businesses um, in signing new deals and in driving ROI within your portfolio companies and finding exits. Uh, Orlando, let's start with you. Um, just because from the buyout side of things, we've seen a, a pretty dramatic slowdown in 2022. Um, getting deals done is, is a bit harder than perhaps it's been in the last decade or so. Um, how does the public market feed into that? Well, thank you for having me, by the way. And it's great to be here with the goats. <laughs> no, it's really, really fun to be here with you. Um, we, were, we were talking about this before. For us, since we do so many take privates in buyouts, in software, that's where the market is. That's where companies always want to go to. So if you have any size at all, it's going to be a take private. The, you have an immediate value reduction from where the market was. It's not like you have to wait a couple of years until private sellers decide where the true valuation may be at that time. Mm. Now, the challenge is that the more you wait, the lower it goes. Because on the one hand, we feel that the trends in software of enterprises going digital, that's just still at its infancy. And those are some really long-term powerful trends on the one hand. On the other hand, global investors have said over the last 10 years, they were, they were happy buying high growth. It was very popular, regardless of the business economics or profitability. And finally, with all the issues that we have going on, they want profitability now. So what's a company worth that is growing at 30% and making no money? 20 times revenue, 10 times revenue, three times revenue? I mean, at some point, it gets pretty cheap. But now there, there has been no bottom to that. And the next challenge to that is, what happens if things slow down? And that is likely to come. And what, are, what is a decelerating revenue-based valuation worth? So it, it's kind of like the longer you wait, the better it might get. On the other side, if you can create the margin and the earnings, you do a good deal when you can, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which yeah. is kind of where we are. Yeah. Bill, you're nodding. Well, I'm, I'm agreeing with Orlando. I, I, I think that we're in a fundamental uh, shift in the public markets where it's repricing itself. And, it's reconnecting to fundamentals. If you think of the last two years, we were disconnected from fundamentals. And so now the market is getting in touch with what is the sustainable growth rate of a company? What's its real long-term profitability? I agree with Orlando. Companies that are growing without profit, that's gonna be very difficult to get a, a good rating in the public market. But as the, as the public market re-rates, the private market will follow. Mm -hmm. And it's taking longer this time. I think it's more of a, a two to four quarter phenomena but the public markets will ultimately reprice the private markets, and we're, we're waiting for that opportunity. So then, uh, you know, given all that, is it easier to do deals now because valuations are getting cheaper, or is it harder because there's volatility? Sellers may not want to either give away equity or uh, sell the company. In the current environment, is it, is it harder? I, I tell you what we go through, which is really, really interesting. When I started in software in 2000, and that was after you, the name of the game then was you had to be really frugal because there wasn't that much growth and the dot-com bubble had just burst. So you had to be valuations. You had to be really careful about what you were paying and patience and watching companies through that to see if they really had yeah. the resilience to get through that time was how you really got deals done. In the last 10 years, especially the young people that have done great in the business, the way to get a deal, a deal done was you were fast, you were preemptive, you were first, and you were most aggressive. Now it's going back to that world, even though every crisis is different, of where there are a lot of assets available, people are being careful with their capital, but it's more of a stock picker's market. You have more to choose from in the public environment. You have less players competing for the same asset. You have bigger assets, and where do you want to spend your time? It's just a different challenge. It is counterintuitive, though, that the publicly traded software companies are more likely to sell in this environment where their stock prices are down hmm. than, than they are when their stock prices are doubling every day, yeah. right? Because the world is great and everybody's happy. Now they're looking for an answer. 
uh, that they may not have to those investors that want profitability. Well, I, I think one thing that we, we talked about and we saw is with the average IPO down 40% from last year, for a lot of companies going public, it hasn't worked. And they're not getting the benefits of being public. They're sitting there with shareholder bases that are not really long term, are not really deeply committed to the company, and they're saying to themselves, what's the benefit of being public? Uh, and so I think there's a whole question there. I think it raises questions for our portfolio companies about what's the right time to exit? When will the IPO market come back? It may be several years, actually, before there's a really constructive IPO market. Several years? Yeah, I think so. It could take a while. Because uh, we're already at a two-decade-long drought for, for initial public offerings. and Down dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, but, but right now, I think until the markets reconnect to fundamentals and we start to see the kind of long-term growth rates and profitability, it's going to take a while. Hmm. There was a, a recent frequent survey of venture capital and private equity allocators that found that 68% are concerned about the VC exit environment and 67% are concerned about the PE exit environment. Um, you know, with that, that backdrop in mind, what do, you, what do you tell your portfolio companies in terms of the ability to exit? What do you tell your LPs? Well, we're telling people to extend your runway. I mean, manage your cost, um, get focused on uh, fundamentals. You know, what are your key KPIs? What is your long-term profitability? And, and buy yourself time. Uh, that's what we're, we're preaching to all of our portfolio companies right now. A, a little bit of a hunker down mentality, but, but do stay focused on the long-term, figure out what your growth drivers are and invest in those areas. But uh, prepare for a little bit of a longer term uh, runway before you could possibly go public. I, I agree 100%, Bill, and for us, there, there are two things. One is never be afraid to sell. Yeah. It, right? Yeah, in the, once again, in the last 10 years, whenever you would have sold, ah, you wish you would have held it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it became really popular to hold it longer because things were going up. Now, for the last year and a half, not so much. All you, all you need to sell a company is one buyer. You don't need 100. Yeah. And if you have the right one that wants your company, it's so hard to know whether you should hold it or not. But, but if you lean on no, not being afraid to sell, that usually helps you over time. I, I think we're going to get consolidation, which will be benefit both of our portfolio companies, because I, I think the public markets will want greater scale. Mm. Um, some of the companies that went public last year really had not achieved critical mass, in my view, in terms of their business. And I think consolidation will happen and the market will want larger, larger cap, larger scale companies. So I think we'll see a nice consolidation base, which should be good for, for our businesses. I love that you said that because I was going to say that. Okay. Okay. No, I, I, do, I do because you, you have to also do whatever, you have to do the best you can with what the market serves yeah. you. Yeah. So your portfolio company, you tell them, yeah, it might be a terrible time to sell. Is it an awesome time to consolidate your yeah, market? Exactly. And if you're the best run company, yeah. then go for it. And you might be better off in the long term. So consolidate privately with the potential on-ramp for an IPO or another yeah, type for, of- Further down the road. But I, I think one thing that you might have seen, Orlando, we, we definitely saw was in a lot of spaces, new spaces, instead of three or four or a company's being created by venture capital, there were seven or eight during this upcycle. And there's a need for consolidation and, and shake out to get to a, 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 you know, a two or three person market. Most technology markets usually have a market leader or one or two fast followers by the time they go public, not seven or eight. And so I think you're gonna need a period of consolidation given how much venture activity there was and how many companies were created during this upcycle. So it should, I think it'll be, a, be an exciting period for that. A few months ago, Sequoia warned that the current environment is a, quote, crucible moment, urging their portfolio companies to cut costs and conserve cash because the sector is in for a prolonged downturn. Um, Orlando, you've said for a while now that growth at all costs is over, um, but what does the cost of this growth ultimately look like in terms of layoffs, in terms of drawdowns, in terms of startup shutdowns. Paint us a picture of kind of what you're bracing for with regard to kind of the fallout from all this. Yeah, it's, it, it's tough. Our, our school of thought, how we were taught by operators, is you always protect your P&L. You live and die by your P&L, and you never dip your margin, unless you have a compelling investment that you can measure separately. And, it, and if you do it yeah. that way, yeah. Right? You have the discipline of price exceeding labor inflation. You have the discipline of productivity. And then when things pick up, you're really ready to invest back in the business. You're not investing now when maybe your customers are not ready. And some of them is slowing hiring. Some of them is reorganizing your business. And some of them is cutting uh, until you see you know, some runway. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't, I think it's not, as you're saying on the, it's not cutting for cutting's sake, it's making the right investment decisions, using precious capital to fund the long-term growth of the company. And I think one thing that people lost sight of completely, we, we, we were both commenting on it around long-term profitability. People you know, were like growth at all costs, but they, they had no sense of what is my long-term operating margin? Am I a 20% margin business, a 30% margin, 15%? So we're telling our management team, get focused on your long-term profit targets and start working your way towards that. And then that will set up, I think, a much more attractive value creation story down the road. Yeah, and speaking of valuations, it seems like lately we've heard about um, either flat rounds, down rounds, a lot of entrepreneurs are used to seeing pretty significant up rounds. Does the, the investing universe shift to be more EBITDA focused, to be more profitability focused, where they're used to uh, valuing companies based on, on revenue growth, especially if, if these companies are kind of choosing different trade-offs with regard to conserving cash and at, potentially at the expense of, of growing their footprint, growing their TAM? I think you're going to see a shift from growth to profitability in terms of valuation. I, I think the days of just revenue multiples are over and it's going to be people trying to make judgments about long-term profitability and long-term sustainable growth. That's a lot healthier market. And you know, what relating to an earlier question you asked, Leslie, is if you look at PE to growth rate, why, why is the private, why is the private market slowed down in terms of financing? Public markets, take, just take the S&P went from 1.9 times you know, PE to re revenue growth ratio, peg ratio, is down to about 1.1, 1.2 times. So growth has been repriced in the public market downward. That is just filtering its way through the private market. And it's gonna take some time for entrepreneurs to accept the fact that growth is priced differently. And that's why you have a bit of a stalemate right now in terms of valuation. I think that it will clear itself over the next few quarters, but right now it's, it's a are little you, bit Are you tough. finding that stalemate as you're having conversations with potential investments as well with companies that are? Well, well we, we, it's, we're, we're trying to find common ground on valuation. We look to the public market as a benchmark and we see that growth has been fundamentally repriced and we're trying to apply that thinking to the private market and yet some of the private companies are still anchored in 2021 and we've moved, we're, in a different, we're in a fundamentally different investment environment now. And, and as Orlando said earlier, the economic environment's a bit uncertain. Mm. We don't know where that's going to head. You too. You've, you've experienced the same thing and kind of jostling over price and, and having those conversations, or is it a little bit steadier when you're looking to do a, a, a buyout because you do have the public market that's telling you every day, essentially, what, what a company might be worth, or at least what a collective group of public market yeah. investors believes it to be worth? The mark helps. Yeah, the mark does. Right? It the does mark, help. The mark, does. Everybody staring at it helps. The, 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 the other thing that really helps is you have a mark, but what happens in this environment if you miss? if you decelerate, and every quarter you're staring at that potentially when there are more headwinds, and that helps you get a deal done. Yeah, I, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to talk about Orlando, it was just this whole idea, these companies that went public last year that are trading at deep discounts to those IPO prices, many of the investors have left those companies. You know, what happens? I mean, and, and some of them have missed their numbers. Some of them have not hit their growth estimates and, and, and are not necessarily tracking towards attractive levels of profitability. And they're, they're still out there as, as public companies. So we've got to figure out what's going to happen to them. Hmm. Some will go private, I think. And talking about consolidation, your great point, they can't buy. Yeah, they can. Because they won't raise the capital and the, the, the stock price is not at a level where their shareholders yeah. put up with buying. How do you motivate your employees? How do you feel like your management team are winners? How do you show the market that you're doing great, your customers, and get that momentum? It's really hard. Yeah, yeah. It, it's going to be an interesting time. One potential buyer that was in the market in the last few years and less so these days is that of the SPAC market. That was a, a nice exit for a lot of portfolio companies, some PE firms, looking at you, um, raised oh, no. of their own. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What, what do you think happens to that market? Is that, is that ever going to look like it did in, in 2020, 2021, or is that just an option that's now off the table due to regulation and all sorts of liabilities for underwriters and things that have come to the forefront this year. Well, Not to I, mention the market Orlando, volatility. You should comment on it, but I mean, capital markets go through cycles. We had an incredible cycle for SPAC capital raising in 2020 and then 2021. And it was a, it was a you know, we, we sold some of our companies to the SPAC market. There, it, was a, it was a very attractive buyer and a very attractive source of capital. That's dried up now as the market's gone risk off. 
it'll come back at some point in time. I don't know when, but, but for, for the time being, it's, it's, it's not an active market. Do you think it comes back to the scale it once was, or is that, are those days over? I, I agree with Bill. It's, it's just another form of finance. And it yeah. got really thrown yeah. away and also got caught up in the current market environment of decreasing asset prices, which yeah. is really hard to pull the trigger and de back when everything's down 50%. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so it kind of takes that away. I mean, for us, we thought we partnered with a great company. They had 30% margins, growing over 50%, great team. It, it was a great experience from a partnership perspective. Where it was tough, it wasn't a great experience from the time spent with the street. Yeah. You, you yeah. weren't really building the business. You were talking to potential investors with you in the deal, and that's where you were spending most of your time. Yeah, the pipe investors. This yeah. is Iron Source you're talking Correct. about. Correct. Um, so you're talking mostly with the pipe investors, not as much focused. Not as much with the company. Huh. And, and that, that kind of makes you appreciate the businesses that we're in. Yeah. Private equity, yeah, where you get to spend all your time trying to add value to the company and focusing on what matters, not on what other people think matters. And it's a very powerful alignment engine. Fascinating. Um, we, we spoke about this on TV a little bit earlier, but just to kind of dig into the topic a little further is, is crypto. Um, and, you know, we were talking about due diligence in the crypto space. That is an area that's been consolidating. I know you've backed FTX, which has been a, a large consolidator in the crypto ecosystem. Um, but you're, you're not pausing, but you're, you're taking a bit of a breather, taking more time to do deals given some of the dynamics that you've seen out there. Do you care to extrapolate? Yeah. Um, we, we talked about it on TV. My, my personal views, which I think is shared by the rest of my firm, is crypto is here to stay. If you look yeah. at where the young, bright, creative people are going, oh, so many of them are going to that ecosystem. Young people want their own financial system. Who doesn't want a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system? There's great business model innovations in that space. That's one thing. On the other side, with every new space, there's a lot of promoters. Yeah. There's a lot of fraud. And there's a lot of very loose business practices. We feel that in our growth fund, and I want to see what you have to say about it, we've partnered with some great companies. And we want to see how that does before we yeah. triple down on that. And that's yeah. kind of the way we do business. Yeah, I, I, I think um, crypto a little bit throws us off the plot in the sense that I think this is a, a permanent change in, in computing and a new computing architecture. You think about Web3, you think about blockchain, this isn't going away. It's going to be a source of tremendous innovation for the next decade. And so everybody wants to focus on the price of Bitcoin, the price of Ethereum. The real focus ought to be, what does this new computing architecture look like and what innovation is going to happen on top of it? And I think Orlando's right. We're going to see a lot of very interesting investment opportunities because the technical talent's there. The technical talent has gone to Web3 and said, we want to work in that environment in terms of building new software companies and new innovations. And cryptocurrencies are the tool to facilitate Web3 and blockchain. Mm. And so that, that's what's really exciting. I think it's going to be a great area. But like, like every new space, when AI first came out, there's a lot of speculative activity and, there, and loose business practices, but long term, it's a real market. And, and so we just have to keep an eye on it. And, and you think about what Bill said about consolidation. It is so powerful in down markets. If the best run company will do so much better because yeah. they can consolidate that market and became, become one of the, that's what FTX is doing. They kind of have a private equity playbook mm -hmm. in their space. Since their margins are so great on their core business, they can then use that cash flow to consolidate yeah, their, their, their market. But there aren't that many companies that can do that. It's just a matter of the, those that can in the privileged position being able to, to use it in this current environment. Um, you know, we spoke a lot about IPOs. We spoke a lot about exits. And, and Bill, I have to ask you, because there is this trend toward PE firms doing IPOs of their own, investment firms doing IPOs of their own. And GA has reportedly been exploring this idea uh, where are you on that? And can we take that as a sign that you do believe, you do have confidence that the IPO window will open soon? Well, I think it's going to take a while for the IPO window to open, as, as I said, because I think the market's sort of a, a, in a you know, risk-off mentality. It's going to take a bit of time for investors to, to adjust. But, you know, we're, we're, we're building our business. Uh, you know, our focus is on delivering results for our investors. 
But I think like, like any company, we should be considering all alternatives for how we build our business and how we make General Atlantic stronger as a global investor. And that, that could come in a lot of different forms. IPO is one option. Staying private is another great option as well. But you know, one thing I, I, I do know, if we do consider going public, it'll be because there's a real strategic imperative to do it. And two, it will not detract from our focus on investment excellence. And those are, those are going to be paramount no matter which direction we, we pursue. So perhaps in a year or two. Per, perhaps. Uh, Orlando, any thoughts on that front for Toma Bravo? Dale's going to do that great, and then you're going to tell me all about it <laughs> to, see how, to see if I change my mind. <laughs> but, but, we were sure. We I were sure. Great, it's right it. outside. We always can always notes, so we yeah, will. Love tap that. his brain for how that's going. But look, for us, it's the same as Bill said. As long as you put up the numbers and you focus on that's that, a, everything else comes that's together. That's number one. And as long as it doesn't detract from that, it could be a viable option. Personally, I always say, Right? There are three things that matter in our business. Get the money, get the deal, and improve the performance of that deal. Yeah. And if it's additive to any of those three, or to all, you may want to consider it. Well, we will, uh, we will follow up with you guys yeah. in a year. Yeah, I think that both of our firms are focused on delivering great investment results for our limited partners. That's, that's paramount. And anything that helps contribute to that, whether it's scale, global reach, being private, being public, being a partnership, that's what matters, and that's what we should be focused on. Uh, let's move outside the U.S. if we can in, in the re remaining time, because, uh, Bill, you've been very active in China, and I know when we yeah. spoke about a year ago on CNBC, um, you talked about how investing, the reward of investing in China was worth the headache. Of course, ByteDance and Ant Group, two very prominent investments of yours, um, due to you know what you described as just the incredible amount of innovation that's taking place in the region. Given the current geopolitical environment, and so much has changed, obviously, in the last yeah. year, do you still believe it? Well, the risks of investing in China are elevated. There's no question. And it relates to you know, the tension in U.S.-China relations and, I would say, greater uncertainty on the exit environment. It used to be that there was a very clear playbook on companies using the VIE structure going public in, on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or maybe the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And that's become more challenged for lots of, I would say, geopolitical reasons. But uh, I, I stand by what we talked about last year. The quality of the entrepreneurs are, is excellent. Uh, the quality of the businesses are excellent. They've got a very large and growing domestic market. Um, and, and we think these companies can build tremendous value by capitalizing on that. I don't think that's changed. But the risks are elevated. And it shows. I mean, the, uh, it, it, amazing. I talked about the uh, S&P 500 trading at now uh, 19 times earnings. You know, the MSCI China Index trades at 10 times earnings. I mean, you know, it's incredibly cheap, and, and yet the growth is extremely high relative to uh, the global market. So we still think it's a strong case for investing in China. What do you think, Orlando? Is the U.S. kind of the hallmark for where you hang your hat, given just the, the plethora of software innovation here, or are you seeing it outside the U.S. as well? Buyout software is a North America business. Yeah. For, uh, for, the, 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 right, for software, enterprise software, yes. You're really, really, really North America centric. Uh, Asia for us is years away. I think that's right. right? I think you're right, Orlando. Right I software. think the B two B software market is not there yet for your style of investing. It's a B two C market, really, right now. Is what it is. And and those great exactly those huge investments you've made are B two C, and that's a very thriving market. Now Europe is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Europe now has yeah. the depth. Yes. Of, of sizable software assets. Secondly, they're cheaper than in the US. And third, in the last five years or so, when a company dominates a country, yeah. their second market wants to be the US, not dominating the rest of, of the EU yeah. or EMEA, yeah. which US firms can add value to that. So we're, we're highly interested in, in that as a next step. And I just want to end things on an optimistic note because I, I know it's been a tough year for tech investors. It's been a tough year for growth. So I'm curious, just in, in the remaining minute here, uh, what investment opportunities are you most excited about right now, Bill? Well, I, I think we're going to have an, a really interesting uh, tech cycle coming up built on the back of, of 5G. I mean, by the end of this year, you're going to have basically a billion people on 5G, you know, going to basically 80% of the, of the world by 2030. That's going to lead to tremendous innovation in edge computing, cloud computing, IoT, et cetera. So we're spending a lot, of, a lot of time on that. And the second area that I think is going to be quite interesting is the next generation of semiconductor companies. I mean, there has been, you know, we, we know the NVIDIA is the Qualcomm, but 
right, we're seeing it in the venture space right now. A tremendous set of new chip companies being developed. A lot of them are basically taking advantage of some of the shift out of China that we know about. And that's going to be an interesting area too. Quantum computing is going to, to leverage off the back of some of those new semiconductor companies. So that's an exciting area for the future. That is exciting. Uh, Orlando, what are you most excited about from an investment opportunity standpoint? Cybersecurity. In B2B software, when you look at that big pie of cyber, it's a problem. It is, has explosive growth, has so many threat vectors, it's always changing. It is just ripe and really, really full of I opportunity. Agree. I agree with Orlando on this. And it, it, it actually, we, we sort of extend the thought into digital identity, this whole notion of our digital identities and how they enable us tied with cyber. It's going to be, it's, it's, it's a great market now. I think it'll be, get even better over time.